Hi, my name is Chris, and I get to pastor this amazing group called Destiny Church. I'm so thankful that you're joining us today, and we would love to hear your story of what God is doing in your life. You can visit us at our website at destinychurchjacksonville.com and click on our testimony link. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can also do that online. Now, get ready to prepare your hearts to receive a word from God. Yeah. Wow. I'm not sure who he was talking about. Man, sounds like a pretty neat person up here. Uh, hey, it is a joy to be with you and to be back here with Brother Chris, Miss Jody, their family, all of you. And, uh, you know, let me just say this before I start speaking. Let me speak before I speak. How about that? Uh, your greatest joy through the years isn't going to be about you. You know, get that with the legacy. Our society is so self-centered. You can't watch television or anything. It's all about self-gratification, what you can get, what you can have, where you can go, who you can be. And uh, that is so shallow. Now, we all need to be blessed. You, if you're not blessed, you can't be a blessing. But your greatest joy, it's not about you. It's about what's going on beyond you to the people, the family, the individuals, ministry, yeah, your seed, people at work. It's not just church. It's everything that you touch. And when you see that moving forward because of something you've placed in them, that is your joy. That's part of your reward in heaven. So we do love this couple. We, we honor them and we bless them. They're for you. They're for this city. They're committed to you. They're committed to the Lord. Can we give your pastors a hand clap? Come on, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, they're like our kids. So there we go. Let's just leave it at that. Um, I want to speak on legacy and just tie into all the things that pastor has been speaking to you about. So listen today. I need you to listen with even a third ear with what I'm speaking. Some of you think a third ear, that sounds kind of weird, but I'm talking about your spirit, man, opening up to what I have to say. So I, I want to speak on the subject, leave a lasting impression. Everybody say impression. Big difference here between impression and impressing. So that's what I want to talk about. We're going to look at scripture, and then I'm going to challenge you with that thought. Leave a lasting impression. What is an impression? Well, it's a lasting mark. It's a spot. It's an indenture. It's something because you have been involved with that person, touching, mentoring, caring, loving, correcting. And they're getting, we won't even go on what that means to correct because there's a process to do that in a loving way, but your mark is on their life. There's a fragrance of you on their life. And who has that right now? And sometimes I think the devil deceives us. Well, I'm not a missionary in Africa, so I can't do anything of value. Well, I'm not a pastor of a church. I can't do anything of real value. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Do you hear me? Every one of you has a gift. Every one of you is a gift. Every one of you has something God has placed in you. It could be dealing with the home. It can be dealing with business, uh, life, who knows, all the things, but it's coming alive with the things God has placed in you, and then you leaving an impression to the people coming up under you, your family and everyone else in the body of Christ. Amen? So look, we're going to look at Scripture. We're going to go real fast with this. So write these Scriptures down because I want you to be able to look at it and study it later. I'm going to start in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And it says this, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Great. Now this is coming up. Uh, the New Testament reveals that this prophecy refers to John the Baptist. You can look at it later in Matthew chapter 11. The future ministry of the coming prophet is described in terms of putting families back together, making families right. And I'm going to say, yes, literal families, but spiritual families, spiritual impartation, spiritual transference because of impressing with an impression 
not impressing with yourself. Big difference. There is something in you that others need. There's something in you that if you don't give it away, it's going to die and stop with you. Well, that's going to take time. That's going to take sacrifice. Yeah, that's where you come alive. Because if everything is about me and what I can do and where I can go and what I can have, you're going to be miserable. But when you suddenly realize, I'm alive to die. I'm alive to give everything God's been placing in me to the next generation and people below me and people coming up under me. That's where you come alive. And that's why our nation isn't alive today. That's why you go in restaurants and you see people and they look bored stiff. Everybody's on their phones. And what are they doing? They're trying to impress people with things that aren't true. They are. Uh, Jeanette and I had the privilege several years ago. We had a really neat vacation, and we were in Italy. So we're, one day we're in Venice, and we just had that day. And we're running around. I'm just having a blast. I majored in architecture before going to Bible college and seminary. And so I, I just love anything with structures. And we were amazed at the people from all the nations of the world. there by themselves, millennials and others, with their selfie stick. I finally learned what that thing was, you know. And standing in all these positions, just trying to get the right picture of themselves. Nobody's with them. I'm watching because I'm looking at the buildings, but I'm a people watcher too. And they're trying to get this right picture so they can then post it to impress other people where they were with nobody to leave a lasting impression to. It broke our heart. It broke our heart. It was just fake. Yes, thank you, honey. Acts chapter 2, 17 through 19. In the last day, God says, I will pour up my spirit upon all people. Do we have any all people in the house today? Your sons and daughters, in other words, those that you're wanting to leave a lasting impression, they will prophesy. I told my kids growing up, hey, the Lord's going to show you what to do, but you are going to serve the Lord. We're going to make sure of that. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike. They will prophesy, and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. I want to share on legacy in your lasting impression. This is an import, importation that we often can miss in our wonderful culture and in our wonderful nation of America. Could it be? Now, just walk with me. Listen with me. Listen with your heart. Listen with your spirit, okay? That the Lord hides his greatest treasures of impression, you leaving a lasting impression to others until you've walked through different stages of life, till you've experienced life and you refuse to be bitter. Where you've walked through disappointment and you say, glory be to God, I turn it all over to him. Yes. Where you realize God is not here to give you a continual Disney World experience, but he's here to mature you and cause you to reflect the image of Christ. And even take the things that have been hurtful and painful, and then you say, thank you, Lord, you've touched me and you've healed me. Now I've got something to leave a lasting impression to other people. And it can be someone way up in age, but you could be a teenager and there's things that you've experienced that you can leave a lasting impression and be involved in teaching those little ones back there right now. Amen. See, it doesn't matter your age. It's have you been touched? Have you allowed the Lord to do a work in you so that you've realized, wait, I've experienced these things, great things, neutral things, difficult things, and I understand it all makes a spiritual resume in my life, and there's something I'm to do with other than just, oh, oh. I'm supposed to now live this and touch it and give it away by leaving a lasting impression, not be impressed. You know, in our country... In our culture, unfortunately, we have a performance-based culture. We value those who are currently contributing. If you're contributing in some way, you're valuable. If you're not, you're not as valuable, and we're not impressed with you anymore. 
Now, that's our culture, whether we want to admit it or not. And there is a difference between impression and impressing. Big, big difference. Again, uh, look, I'm not against social media. I had our youth pastor and our young married couple do a whole service last week on how to use it in a positive way. But as a whole, social media is there just to impress. Just to impress. So don't let that be your identity. Amen? Amen. Let the work of the Lord and what he's doing in you be the identity so you can leave an impression. In Scripture, it's those who advanced in years, those who have walked through things, those who had come through difficulty and they were faithful to the Lord that had something of value, something that was transferable. Come on. There you go. Something transferable. You have something transferable. If you're saved, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you've let God do a work in your life, if he's taught you this, if he's given you that, and so forth, there's something in you that's transferable that someone needs from you. So an opinion, here we go. I'm not going to say it's a thus saith the Lord. I'm real careful with this. An opinion that I have, could it be that the awakening, the revival, uh, the move of God, whatever we want to call it, that we all want for America, anybody want that? Okay, could it be hindered because of the separation of generations and the separation of impartation that's not taking place? Could it be? Could it be? Again, the scriptures we read in Malachi and Acts. Paul writing to Timothy, a son in the faith, you can have children in the faith. Chris and Jody are some of our children in faith. Tony Benedetti, he's back there some with children. He's a son in the faith. Oh, is he right here? Look at him right there. Yeah, but the lights, I can't tell. Laurie, I mean, just all these different ones. Other family that are from Kentucky. Children in the faith, praise God. And he says this, Paul writing, don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Be an example. Leave an impression. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, and your purity. So in Scripture, it was those who had this understanding. Okay, God's done something to me. I'm now to deposit that. I'm to live that and give that. God is sending Elijah, the prophet, in type to restore sons and daughters. The connotation is that the generations are going to be joined so there's legacy. Everybody say your word. Say it with me. Legacy. legacy. So there's a multi-generational impact. So there's a lasting impression. And if not, Malachi said, we're smitten with a curse. Now, what is the curse? Several answers we could give. But in context with this message and your theme that uh, Pastor has been talking about, when you separate the generations, when you refuse to leave an impression to those coming up under you in years or in experience, very often you're going to leave an impression in someone maybe older than you, but your experience is older than them. Amen? Okay. When you separate the generations, when you live a self-consumed, self-centered American dream, ooh, life, to impress rather than leave an impression, a measure of awakening only lasts for that generation. Just right there. If we only want to relive and celebrate what we've experienced and not what God is doing now, that is a dangerous thing. Now, I've watched people through the years Oh, pastor, I remember back in the 70s when God did said, great, that's over. What are you letting him do now? Yes, sir. See, we, we've got to be now, leave an impression now with what God is doing in our life. Now, are we saying it's about me? And listen, I can go into any setting, any church, and I can receive because it's not about me. I said, it's not about me. It's about all those coming up under, and can, what can I do to leave some type of impression with one person today? Does everyone believe in sowing and reaping? Okay, let me read Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. 
God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, whatever a woman sows, they're going to reap that. Amen? Amen? But in light of what I share today, I want to submit a thought to you. The highest level of receiving is not sowing and reaping. It's inheritance. Now think on that for a moment. It's inheritance. But in order to receive an inheritance, I must Honor the generation of experience or the generation of age older than me who have walked through more than me, who have handled more than me, who have received more than me, and place myself in a position where I honor them and I respect them and I listen to them so that I may receive that inheritance I'm talking about here a spiritual inheritance, not something of money, okay? Nothing wrong with that, by the way, okay? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that type of inheritance, but a spiritual inheritance. Hebrews talks about the elementary principles of Christ. And I'm kind of jumping different places, but I have one shot at you, so I've got to cover a lot. Hebrews 6 talks about them. Bring, bring up Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Let us just stop going over these six basic things over and over. I won't read the whole scripture. We're repenting from evil deeds, placing our faith in God, all that type of stuff. Baptism, laying on of hands, the resurrection of dead, eternal judgment. All right. One of the elementary principles, an elementary principle of Christ is the laying on of hands. It's mentioned with all the others right here. Now, the laying on of hands is one of the things that we all do. If you need a healing, I need a healing, I'll come up and say, pray for me. Lay hands on me. I need a healing. And don't stop doing that, by the way. Hey, I, I've got an issue. Agree with me in prayer, and you'll join hands with someone. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll lay hands on someone to receive. That is all great. Let it increase through all of our lives. And everybody says, amen. amen. But as I look at this in Hebrews and throughout Scripture, the laying on of hands is very often, especially in the Old Testament, for the passing, the impression that you want to leave in someone's life, the blessing you're wanting to leave, an intentional, I'm touching you to leave a deposit of what I have received so that you have it and you can stand on my shoulders and run further than me. The laying on of hands. Examples. So let's talk about a few of them. Jacob and his brother Esau. Jacob challenged his brother Esau. He, he was the firstborn. The firstborn always got a double portion. He was after that, and so he deceived his father. Actually, he had deceived his brother way back for the birthright and so forth. Now it's playing out with his father, Isaac. And so his father thinks it's Esau, but it's Jacob. And so he blesses him, lays hands on him, and blesses him. The only thing, listen, the only thing Isaac did was lay hands on him and say words. That's all he did. They didn't exchange property, material things. He just said words. You can look it up in Genesis 27. Something was passed to him that was invisible to the eye but left a lasting impression that was very powerful in the reality of the spirit. Do we realize the power of our words? Good and negative. Psalm 1914, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. I ought to say that about every other hour. How about James 3, 2 through 10? Let's bring New Testament in. Indeed, we make many mistakes, and I've got my hands up, and everybody says, amen. amen. You're agreeing that I make a lot of mistakes? That we should, no, okay, that you do as well. For I, if, if we could control our tongues to, use, to, to leave a lasting impression instead of criticizing, judging, critiquing, hurting, we would be perfect, could also control ourselves in every other way. 
We can make a large horse go wherever we want it to by means of a small bit in its mouth. And Carrie says, <laughs> yeah, he waved his hand. He wouldn't say it out loud. All right. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go. Even the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole f life on fire. It can set on fire be set on fire by hell. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish. I don't know how you tame a fish. Chris and I couldn't tame any of them to come on our hook yesterday, really, but I guess some people can, t well, big fish, dolphins, and so forth. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father. Sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. So when I understand, deposit, what I've received from the Lord, what I've received as inheritance from mentors in my life and people who have spoken into my life, I'm to use this thing right here. I'm to use my hands to be a blessing to speak life, to see something over them, begin prophesying over them their destiny. Destiny, that's a good name for a church, by the way. Start, start seeing and, and declaring and helping. And I see this potential in you. Listen, let me, let me spend some time with you and, and just kind of show you some things the Lord has showed me. Or, man, I've got this trade. Let me show you how you can do this and you can bless your family financially on and on and on because it's about other people. It's not about us. And when you think about other people, that's when you come alive. And God blesses you back, by the way. You know, I think there's a scripture, give and it shall be given unto you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. For with the same measure you give, it will be given back to you. Now, we don't give with that motive in mind. But as you want, I'm going to leave an impression. I'm going to, leave an, I'm to help. I'm going to give. I'm going to give everything away from, in my life to someone else. Wow. You, how many believe you can't outgive God? All right. You just agreed you're going to leave a lasting impression. I tricked you there. It was worth it. Skip down another generation. When Jacob, who had deceived his brother and father, he's now old. He's about to die. And we had the 12 children. They had to go to Egypt. Joseph is second in command. Joseph realizes the day it is about to die. Joseph wants his father to bless his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. He takes them to his father so he would lay his hands on them and say words over them and bless them. And he gets there and brings them to his dad. Dad can barely see or not see at all. And his dad crosses his hands. How many remember that story? Okay, Genesis 48, 17 through 20. When Joseph saw his father place his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, no, dad, look, this, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. His father refused and said, I, I know my son, I know. He too will become a people and be greater than he, and his descendants will become a, a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim, who is the secondborn, and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Now, is he saying this one's not, not any good? No, he sees something of a potential, a deposit, something that he needs to bring to life in that boy. Can we see what God sees sometimes? It, you know what? It doesn't take a genius to see the need in someone's life or to see something that's not right spiritually in their life. My goodness, I'm glad God doesn't look at me that way every day. If he did that, I, I, I wouldn't amount up to anything. I don't want to be on the devil's side and criticize, and I want to be on God's side and laying hands, yes. impartation, and yes. saying, you can do it. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, but they still might be dealing with drugs. Well, what did you deal with in the past? Come on. 
My goodness, like you said, I remember after he got water baptized, him getting in his car, his little sports car, and he's smoking away. I said, I got, I'm going to spank that boy. I'm going to get him, you know. <laughs> and just loving him, spending time with him, doing things in the call of God, I could see it and just speaking it forth. And thank God the Lord brought him Jody to keep him on track. Come on, let's give the Lord for that, half of that. Yeah. Yes. Don't they make an awesome team? They're, they balance one another out. It's so, so good. It's awesome. Okay, I'm sidetracked, but you get the point across. So he blessed the second one above the first one. Still with me? In our culture, we just don't understand the scriptural principle to its fullness. Very often, our people with experience are people who maybe are older in age, which I'm approaching that as well. And they're not maybe able to contribute like they did at one time. We don't seek from them the inheritance. We don't. I believe in your experience and in your twilight years, very often what you've gained, you are the greatest untapped resource. And only people with eyes to see and ears to hear will get it. Anyone older in the Lord that has potentially experienced more life in every aspect, and if they're faithful to the Lord, they have, listen, they have a level of grace upon them that you don't have yet. We value those who perform and not those who've experienced. So we don't see the blessing that we could receive. We would much rather be impressed than someone leave an impression. Could it be the greatest treasure in your life? It's there now, and it's going to increase as you're faithful to the Lord is later in life. Every time you experience a victory, every time you experience some type of setback, every time you experience some type of warfare, and you come through that, and you're faithful to God. I said you're faithful to God. You receive a measure of grace. Where's that in Scripture? 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. In his great grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Now, we could park on that one verse and take it apart to prove this, but just take it and tuck it in your spirit and look at it later. Grace is more than undeserved favor. Grace is actually the riches of God. And Ephesians says he lavishes that on us. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. So if you're older in grace than someone else, there again, this is not an age thing right here, just older in grace than someone else, or you are in your twilight years of your life and you can no longer perform like you once did, the greatest grace is in you. I said it's in you. But only those with eyes to see and ears to hear can get that and receive that as an inheritance. If I value only by performance and I don't realize that I'm working very hard to get what I could receive from someone else. I could get from a mentor by honoring them, them laying their hands on me, praying for me, me sitting under their feet, me being teachable. Anytime I can get with my presbyters or different ones that speak into my life, I drive, I fly, I do whatever I can because I want to honor those that I have said, I want to resonate your qualities in who you are. Talk to me. Correct me. Speak to me. Then I'm positioning myself for a great inheritance. 
you know, I figured out something. I don't know that much. And here's something else. You don't either. <laughs> Please, I'm not insulting you. We don't know that much. We don't. And as Jeanette says, she realized one day nobody cared about her opinion. And she said, that was a rude awakening. Nobody cares about our opinion. But they do care about what you have gone through, what you have lived through, what you have valued, what God has placed in you, and that you're willing to say, you know what, I want to give you that. I, I want you to understand that and receive that in your heart. Okay, one more example. How about Elijah and Elisha? Remember the two? Elisha understood this and requested a double portion of his mentor's anointing and his authority. And Elisha had a double portion. Elisha then had Gehazi, his servant. Remember that? He was kind of in position to receive that. But he didn't pass his test well, and he ended up selling off his inheritance by wanting to receive money for prophetic ministry that Elisha had given to a, a leader. You can read that in 2 Kings 5. So Elisha now is getting old. He's advanced in age. He's about to die. He's trying to pass that inheritance, that blessing, that impartation to the king. I'll show you that in a moment. The king had come to see him before his death. Elijah says to the king, these are the arrows of victory. Anybody familiar with the story? Okay, hit the ground with them and so forth, shoot them. Elisha was giving him a hint and a test. Now, pastor made mention of this. I didn't understand often things that Mark and Jeanette would say, but I would tuck it in. Spirit. Listen, when you're trying to give something to someone, don't be offended when they don't get it. See, then, then it's about me again. I was trying to, they, they didn't receive it. I'm going to go hide for about two years. Get over yourself. Let's get over ourselves. And I didn't worry about it. I just laughed. I thought, he'll get it one day. He'll, he'll get this. He'll understand that. And he'll call me. I understand something now. I said, well, what is it? it? You know, we'll have a great laugh and a great talk and so forth. So he's giving the king a test to see if he's valuing the inheritance he's wanting to give him. And the king did not pass the test. First, second king, excuse me, 13, 14 through 20. And hopefully this will come alive in context to legacy. Elisha had been suffering from the illness which he was going to die. Jehoash, <coughs> excuse me, Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. Now look, you can see here there's a relationship because he says, my father, my father. Now is that his literal father? No, but he's a spiritual father. And he didn't want him to die, didn't want to lose him, and so forth. And he's crying. The chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha says, get a bow and some arrows. He did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. We had taken him. Elisha put his hands on the king's hands, opened up the east window, he said, and he opened it and shoot. So the king is laying hands on his hands to shoot the arrow. And they do this. The Lord's arrows of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the armies of Aphek. Take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, now strike the ground. He struck the ground three times, and he stopped. I don't understand the whole thing here, but he didn't do it enough, okay? He didn't value the instruction enough. He didn't value the word of impartation Enough. He didn't even realize fully this was a moment of impartation. Didn't get it. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated a ram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. Elisha died and was buried. Wow. Elisha, Elijah gave Elisha a test. If you see me, if you keep your eye on me, if you follow these instructions, you'll receive a double portion. And he did. He did twice the number of miracles. If you 
remember the whole story. So Elisha tried to pass his inheritance to the king. Doesn't happen. Listen, if you're going to receive it, you've got to, you've got to place value on it. First, value on the person, and then value on what they want to impart to you. King just thought it was arrows in a little routine. Elisha dies. The story goes on. An enemy army loses a man in battle. They put the dead soldier in Elisha's tomb. When the dead man touches Elisha's bones, what happens? Pow! He comes alive. That's the most amazing, sad story in the Bible. The sad part is that the anointing had died with Elisha. The inheritance. What he had to give to the next generation. It could have been passed on and it wasn't. Elisha's anointing died with him and was passed on to an enemy soldier. Wow. So I wonder how many people with grace on their life. And listen, if you've been serving the Lord for more than one day, there's some grace on your life. You've got something. I wonder how many people with different victories in their life, I wonder how many aged die with a spiritual inheritance that never got transferred. Whatever age received from those above in years, those who've experienced more, those who have walked longer, those who have something that you desperately need. But you've got to see it. You've got to want it. And if you have something, you've got to be able to see it in the next generation and want to give it. We, we, we don't get this in our culture like we need to. We don't get it even in our families like we need to. You know, we, we have five grandchildren now, and man, we, they wear us to a frazzle. But whenever we can have them and lay hands on them and pray and bless them and read to them, and we do it because I, I look at them, I prophesy over them. I call them mighty man of God, mighty woman of God. You're mighty. I just, just, we just say these things constantly, reading to them or playing games or whatever we can do because. We want these children that are growing up in a much more complicated world than our children did to choose God at an early age. Be able to realize they're receiving something as an inheritance that will help them go straight and forward. Oh, and like I said, they'll wear you down. They'll start fighting. They'll this, and you just have to be bigger than all of that and laugh a bunch. If you want to men mentor someone, just laugh a bunch we kept three of them for five days last week. It all runs together because our oldest son and his wife had a retreat. They helped in a counseling ministry in Louisville where they live, and they did a retreat in our city. A family in our church has a, a guest house, and they used that home for a retreat. So we kept the kids, and it was great, and we were worn out. And at night, you're, you're trying to separate them and get them down. And the three-year-old, the way his mind thinks amazes me. <clears throat> so he wants me to read to him. So I said, Declan, go in Papa's room, get one book. Everybody say one. So I go in there, and he's got seven books laid out. I said, okay, get one book. So we read the book. I take time. I'm ready to pray with him. And he goes, oh, Papa, look. Another one, a three-year-old. And so I picked that one. He goes, oh, look, another one. He pirate. Now, what was it? He wanted to receive. He wanted to receive. Who, who, want, who wants to receive from you? Let that be a desire of your heart. Let that be a dream. I'm going to take a moment in closing. I want to honor my mother and get this point across to you. I had her funeral last month. She passed away. She was 86, two weeks short of being 87, lived a full life. She had dementia for six years, I'd say. And um, any of you who have dealt with that understand that 
know what that all involves and energy and so forth. My younger bro brother, who and she lived in Louisiana. We live in Kentucky. My younger brother moved in with her. He's the hero. I mean, he really is. The last three years, basically unplugged from society. Last year, never out of the house. Uh, maybe one time where they were able to finally get her for a doctor's appointment. Not, never out of the house. And she was a very uh, distinguished person, very strong in personality, in nature. Um, I was in Egypt at the time when she had her major uh, issue, made it back in time so we could get down there and be with her. All my brothers and I and Jeanette, we were with her when she went to be with the Lord. A great song was playing at the time. It was, a, man, it was, it was a good thing. You can't threaten the believer with heaven. And so, um, you know, I haven't lived down there in 29 years. The little town where I grew up, the papers just once a week comes out. So we had missed that to get the notification about the funeral in that we put it in the Baton Rouge paper, a big paper. So I, I didn't even know if people would find out because um, I didn't have time to call anyone. We're trying to, we're just trying, when you're in that mode, you're just trying to survive and get everything taken care of. So we have a, a two-hour visitation before the funeral, and we were just amazed. I meant utterly amazed the people that found out and came. They came from states away. Um, I had two of her spiritual daughters speak. With, I didn't, uh, Jeanette, didn't, it was just, you know, when it's your family, it's hard. But two of her spiritual daughters that she had mentored and imparted, they did the majority of the message. It was powerful. I mean, it was powerful. Another man shared. I spoke. I talked about her faithfulness. And I just picked two qualities, faithfulness and forgiveness. She had walked through a lot growing up and so forth. She had forgiven everybody. She just walked in forgiveness. By the way, that's a good thing for us to do. And I had her pastor share. And, uh, but people would come through this line, and your mom led me to the Lord. I didn't realize that. Your mom led me into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Really? I didn't know that. Your mom mentored me on how to cook. Really? Yeah. I would go over once a week, and she would teach me how to cook. That's awesome. Your mom taught me how to dress. I said, really? That, yeah. That, I didn't know what to do, and she taught me how to coordinate things and do that. Wow, that's awesome. Your mom came and decorated our house. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Your mom did this and that. I mean, just person after person. And then one guy in his 50s that I know, I had him actually be a pallbearer. He said, in tears, that was your mom, but she was my mom too. I said, absolutely. And uh, his son was killed in a car accident. And he said, the day after your mom drove up and she called me in the car and sat there for two hours and talked to me and you're going to come through this because my mom lost a seven-year-old son. I lost a brother. So she took everything and would tuck it in there. And when she had the moment of impartation, she just would go for it. Just, yeah, fearlessly, fearlessly. Wow. Amazing. Even to the point after the funeral, when we come back, I'm still getting texts and so forth from people. And um, do y'all do this here where maybe you go to the house after a funeral and uh, people go eat? They do that? Okay. In Louisiana, they do that quite a bit. And, I, you know, I didn't know. We got 70, 80, 90 people came to eat at the house. And that's not, it's like, whoa. They just wanted to talk about what she had done, what she had imparted. This is from uh, one fellow I grew up with. And he lives in another city. And he's uh, a minister at a church now. We were so glad to be there at the funeral. Then he starts talking about his mother. He said his mom, who's also very elderly and couldn't make it because of her age, reminded me that in 1972, wow, your mom graciously presented the gospel without pressure. It was the beginning of the Strat family shift. Our spiritual roots were influenced by your mom's yielding to the Great Commission. For this, we can be eternally grateful to your family. He's a minister. His brother became a missionary in Europe. 
His sister, who I grew up with, we were the same age, she married an attorney who felt his calling was to be in politics, and he's a state senator as a believer. I think that's a pretty good impartation right there. Her funeral, it was just laughter and joy. It wasn't tears. We laughed the whole way through because my mom was a hoot. She would make you laugh and cut up, and she was a missionary uh, after my dad died when I was young. And, you know, just people telling stories about that. It just, it was, it was a fun funeral. Funeral home director said, man, we've not seen anything like this before. And I said, it's a shame. All funerals really should be like this because people give their life away. Yeah. So do we leave a lasting impression or not? Do we, do we grab hold? Do we impart? I said I was in Egypt. Um, one of our young men, good friends with Chris, Tony, um, who was also a drug dealer and so forth, got saved and spirit-filled. He was facing 20, 25 years in prison and radically changed so much the judge let him off. Sent him to Bible school, got married, missionary. He now runs a Bible school in Egypt, Rama Egypt. He has 1,200 students. Isn't that amazing? It's crazy. So I went over. I was with him to minister to pastors and when all this started happening with my mom going downhill. So my oldest son and his wife left the two older children in Louisville, but they brought the baby, uh, our first granddaughter, my mom's first great-granddaughter down. This is about a week prior to her death. I want you to bring up that picture. I don't know if you can see it, but she's, my mom's holding Aria's hand. I know that's hard to see. Afterwards, Jeanette, you have it on your phone too, huh? There you go. That's better. Holding my granddaughter's hand. No telling what impartation is going on. Do we just touch or do we impart? Your greatest days of fulfillment can be ahead as you realize you have something to give. Something that grieves my heart, Jeanette, now we're talking about it, is someone who's experienced much of the Lord, much grace, but yet they don't realize they need to be giving it. And they end up being bitter. They end up being self-centered and not fulfilled. I pray I go to the grave if the Lord doesn't return having nothing left. Nothing. And if I get it and I give it and someone gets it that I'm trying to give it to them, I'm trying to give your pastor and his wife anything we can, they get it. And they run hard after God. That, look, when, when they share victory, I'm more excited than anything I do personally. Because I understand impartation, I understand legacy. Destiny, your greatest days are ahead when you realize you have something to give. <laughs>